Hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Gary Lynch for this lecture tonight. Um, Gary started his lab at UC Irvine when he was in his 20s, and he has remained there ever since. He spent his whole career there, and his contributions to the field of learning and memory are far too numerous to state. Uh, I think he has over a thousand papers, which is just an incredible level of productivity that's not to be believed. But I would just like to uh, <laughs> highlight some of the most, some of the exciting work that led me personally to join his lab as a graduate student back in 1999. And that is his contributions to our understanding of long-term potentiation, which many of us believe to be the synaptic substrate of learning and memory. So Gary's lab made a series of discoveries that led to our understanding of how long-term potentiation is initially induced, and then how it is expressed long-term. And together, these discoveries really form the foundation of what is our modern-day understanding of long-term potentiation, or LTP, and some of the factors of LTP that we just take for granted and sort of believe like they've always been, been known. So I'm just going to highlight a few of them here. Um, the repetitive stimulation patterns that produce long-term potentiation cause calcium-dependent phosphorylation of proteins. That's Browning et al., science, 1979. Long-term potentiation requires postsynaptic calcium. That's uh, Lynch et al., nature, 1983. Long-term potentiation produces structural changes in dendritic spines. If you can believe, this was uh, Lee et al., 1980. Uh, spatial learning and induction of long-term potentiation requires NMDA receptors, Morris et al., Nature, 1986. And yes, that is the Morris of Richard Morris, Water Maze Richard Morris, who will be giving a lecture tomorrow. And NMDA receptors are required for the initial induction of LTP, while AMPA receptors are required for its long-term expression. Mueller et al., Science, 1988. And then, of course, my own personal favorite, <laughs> stimulation patterns that resemble naturally occurring firing patterns of hippocampal neurons optimally induce long-term potentiation. That's the discovery or the introduction of the theta burst stimulation protocol for inducing LTP, Larson and Lynch, Science, 1986. And if there's anyone in this room who's doing LTP and not using theta burst stimulation, please come and talk to me uh, after the talk. <laughs> so more recently, he's investigated many other important questions in the learning and memory field, including understanding mechanisms of spaced learning, um, understanding mechanisms uh, underlying deficits in Fragile X syndrome, and I will you know, let him continue to tell you later about some of the, the more um, recent things he's been doing. But if you've never seen Gary speak, there's a reason why, and that's because Gary does not usually attend meetings. He prefers to remain in the lab, overseeing the many experiments that are always going on in that exciting environment. So you're really in for a rare treat tonight. He's a really engaging speaker. He's hilarious, unconventional, and just like I said, like a really engaging speaker, whether he's talking about neuroscience or talking about one of his many outside interests like ancient Rome or uh, regaling us with tales of one of the recent trips that he's taken with his own LTP, long-term partner in science and in life, Christine Gall. So please, everybody, join me in warmly welcoming Gary Lynch. You hear me? Wow, it works. Thank you so much, Laura. I too remember those days back in the lab when you were there. Laura was something of a terror. Uh, UC Irvine is now finally recovering from her graduate career. And uh, we could spend a full hour going through the adventures of Laura Colgan in Southern California. You'd find it fascinating. 
Isn't this a wonderful meeting? I mean, what can we say about this meeting? I was there 30, yes. I was there 35 years ago uh, when Jim, I, Jim Gall was actually setting this thing up and, and I was sort of helping him a little bit. Who could have imagined that 35 years later it would wind up like this? And this is a, a real tribute to what Mike Yassa has been doing at the center. It's a renaissance, no other word for it. Now, my topic today is up there. It's a taxonomy of LTP, the types of plasticity that are in the hippocampus, and their potential contributions to memory. Anytime you go from the level of neurobiology of a brain structure to talking about memory, you almost necessarily in this day and age start off with some kind of general hypothesis. And this is our general hypothesis. And strangely enough, it resembles quite a bit what Yuri Bazaki was talking about last night. Uh, for once, Yuri and I seem to agree, which is, is enough for me to go re-examine what I've been doing. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't seem possible. Uh, but here's an association cortex, and his problem is time. Time to assemble semantic content. Uh, as people walk through the world, they flaw easily, effortlessly assemble information into semantic clusters and classify the information in hierarchical patterns such that if you see something coming down a road, and this is, is of course a ton of psychological research on this, you see something coming down the road, you'll go vehicle, car, Ford, okay, in that sequence, very rapidly. But it takes hundreds of milliseconds maybe 100 milliseconds, and it's been precisely timed. And we've actually done work in a very simple form of association cortex, doing physiology and modeling, and found that, surprisingly, it does it without any instruction in an unsupervised manner, just using LTP rules, putting input in, the thing forms hierarchical categories. That's a paper that Laura didn't mention. Uh, now, so that's, a, that's, that's the first effort of time. But the real problem for time, for the cortex, is that these semantic episode elements are coming at variable delays, ranging from hundreds of milliseconds to thousands of milliseconds. So somehow or other, and we know the brain does this, we have to associate these things. We have to link them together into what we like to call episodes. And that's a problem. That's a serious problem because if we assume that the LTP is doing this, is being used to do it, LTP imposes a harsh rule. It's a kind of contiguity rule. The QA and the QB must be there at the same time, but they are not. QA, in some cases, was gone by a couple seconds before QE, QB shows up. So that's a problem. And that's one problem that I'll try and tell you that we think the hippocampus is helping to solve. There's another issue that the cortex faces. It doesn't want all these memories to be of the same duration. You know, it's the commonplace example we all say. You might want to know where you parked your car three days ago, but you really don't know, want to know where you parked it three weeks ago. So we need memories of different durations. Now, the hippocampus, I'll argue, is contributing or helping with these problems by using multiple forms of synaptic plasticity. In other words, it's not the case that it's always using what we love to call LTP. It's using different forms of these things that have different durations and different properties and different operating rules. And the second way the hippocampus might be helping out is, and this is surprisingly little stressed, it has unique circuitries and unique features that I'm going to argue give it capabilities far beyond a normal cortex. I suddenly realized I was doing the introduction to the old Superman television program. Powers and abilities far beyond the normal cortex. Yes, it's the hippocampus. Whew. All right. Sorry for that little fugue state I just did there. <laughs> Write that off to the frontal cortex not working completely correctly. We heard all about that this afternoon. Brilliant lecture. Now, multiple forms of hippocampal LTP. 
Here are the three major subdivisions of the structure. The dentate gyrus, as you know, receives a lateral performant path input to the top of its tree, medial performant path to the middle, and the association commercial system at the bottom. Right? Clear enough. Then you have the field CA3 over here, and you have the performant path now shoved all the way to the top of the tree. The, most of the tree is taken up by a massive con commercial associational system generated by CA3. That system is, there, there's, it's hard to think of an associational system that is anywhere near that large elsewhere in the brain. It's a unique feature of hippocampus. And of course, sitting there in CA3 between the two branches of this thing in the apical and basal dendrites, we have the always bizarre and strange mossy fibers. Something found nowhere else in brains. So uh, that's there. Now over here to the right, we have the field CA1. It looks the same as CA3. It doesn't have the mossy fibers. It's dominated by this commercial associational connection that we now call the Schaefer commercials. I put little numbers next to these things because these are connections for which there's enough literature to begin talking the question addressing the question, are these different forms of plasticity all the same? Do they have the same kinds of plasticity in these connections? And here's the taxonomy that we have been working with. As you see, we have a presynaptic LTP. And for those of you who don't know my history, you won't understand this, but it is painful for me to say that word. <laughs> presynaptic LTP. <laughs> You see, you see these, this stuff? Okay, this is what I looked like for a decade in my wars with Eric Kandel and Saul Snyder and Chuck Stevens. It was a bloodbath. It's like that, the lives that were lost, the graduate students' careers that were ruined, arguing about pre- and post-synaptic LTP. And I was Mr. Postsynaptic in those days, and I was right. But, <laughs> thank you, Roger. <laughs> now, that was all over here in the pyramidal cells. Ursula Stoibly came up with the first discovery. She found the mossy fibers. So let's go over here to the left of the slide. There's presynaptic LTP. Ursula found it in the mossy fibers. And that was, that was back in the 80s, and I, I was horrified by it. And I've decided never to go back there again. Uh, but there you have it. She found that it was presynaptic. It's been a long history of mossy fiber, but I think the general consensus is it is indeed presynaptically expressed. I'll tell you in a minute, <clears throat> I will tell you in a minute that the lateral performant path where we wandered into Timbless territory the father of LTP, it is indeed presynaptic. And there's Serena Dudek going, oh, I. Yeah. Uh, now, all the way over on the left, we have the Dente Gyrus Commercial Associational System. And it doesn't have LTP, which helps the categorization a lot. Now, over here to the right, we have postsynaptic LTP. Separated to itself in the dendrogram is MPP, that's medial performant path. This is, the, this is the arrival of the spatial information. This is a postsynaptic form of LTP, but we know from the Irish group in Dublin that this is postsynaptic, but a very strange kind of postsynaptic LTP. So this belongs over here to itself. Then we have the pyramidal cells, apical basal dendrites, proximal distal. They're all different, but they're all postsynaptic. Okay, so we have a categorization scheme. Now those little numbers there correspond to the thing that I showed you earlier. And I'm separating these, by the way, according to these variables I have down here. So let me put all those variables together on one neuron as much as we can, and this is the field CA1. The top of the dendrite, the performant path, uh, Brian Derrick in Texas published a recent paper showing with chronic recording that that LTP is decremental. It's gone in two weeks. It just comes way up and just slides steadily back to baseline. And there are many features about this that I could talk about that would separate this form of LTP on a number of categories. Now, when you get down into the proximal apical dendrites, field number six, 
The LTP here is remarkably stable. Chronic recording studies show that a single data burst train, two seconds of stimulation, 40 stimulation pulses, produces a potentiation that does not decrease for weeks, for as long as electrodes can be held in place. So this is LTP at its most remarkable, because all we, it could be that here it doesn't go away. Okay. Now, the threshold for the effect and the magnitude of the effect, there's nothing unusual, but the consolidation of it is complete. And I'll come back to consolidation. The basal dendrites, there's only one paper that I could find in the literature from Stan Leung, Stan Leung at, uh, in Toronto, and he found in chronic recording the LTP decreases back to zero over one week. So again, decremental. And now we come down to threshold magnitude, they're exceptional. This pathway is the easiest LTP I know of, and it has a huge magnitude. Easy to induce, but it does not fully consolidate. That means that you can reverse the LTP with low frequency stimulation readily, and you can't do that elsewhere. In other words, this kind of LTP, you can erase it very quickly, and for a long time after it's been induced. They're all different. So what do we think of, what do we make of this? We would argue that aspects of memory are encoded for different durations. That these different pathways are carrying with them aspects of the information to be encoded. And once encoding's over, some of those aspects are going to persist for very long periods and others are going to dissipate. All right? And it also make the prediction that the CA3 subfields that innervate that zone six, if you wait a week after encoding and you re-experience the cues or you do retrieval, what you're going to retrieve is a very different picture than what you encoded because you're going to have lost the potentiation, much of the potentiation was really there and you're dominated now by the signal coming from CA3. Now what is that signal? And what I'll try and argue with you Tonight is that that signal is actually the signal that holds the cues together in a sequence. That after a week or two, the main piece of information that the hippocampus has about what was learned was the sequence. There's no content here, just a code about who came what and what the temporal parameters were. Now I need to, what we would love to do is make a taxonomy not on those somewhat artificial variables, but instead on the basic substrate mechanisms that make the LTP. And we can't do that. We only have substrates for two pathways, really. So let me go through the one that we do. Why does stress on substrates? I always feel I need to say this. Why stress substrates? And the answer is, first off, it's a great biological question. I mean, I just said that we can do two seconds of stimulation and modify a synapse for weeks. I mean, biologically, that seems impossible. So what's the mechanism? But beyond that, and there's another practical reason, substrates help you understand how psychiatric conditions that cause memory problems, how they work. But I think the biggest reason we're concerned with substrates is they are predictive of phenomena. The shape and form of substrates predicts phenomena, phenomena about memory that you might never have thought to test or look or look for. So this is why I feel this importance to stress substrates. All right, up in the top of the left-hand corner is a picture from a paper that Michelle Baudry and I published uh, a hypothesis a number of years ago about how LTP happens. And it was a very simple story. In panel A, if you know Michelle, Michelle's a very simple Frenchman. Uh, so it's logical it would turn out having this nice clean little look to it. But the story is theta burst stimulation causes an increase in calcium in the spine head. That causes the spine cytoskeleton to disassemble. That causes in panel B, the spine head to go round to a lower energy state, bringing with it the postsynaptic density, which goes round, and once it's round, from its ellipsoid state, it has room for more glutamate receptors. So now you have a potentiated synapse. That was our hypothesis. 
That hypothesis has been largely borne out. Subsequently, we all know that calcium is a critical trigger for LTP, and that's been shown many times. We did it first, uh, <laughs> just for the record. You know, you know, it was a really hard experiment to do back then, and you know, now everybody, any kid walks into the lab and says, "I think I'll buffer calcium in a postsynaptic neuron with his clamp electrode." Feeling like, anyway. Uh, but when we did it, it was really hard to do it. Now, and also people, of course, with live imaging, seen the spines become rounder after theta burst stimulation. And we've shown imaging-wise that the PSDs are rounder and larger. So it's a good version of what's happening with LTP. But there is the third step. And that third step is a bear. How does the cytoskeleton now reassemble and anchor this whole thing in its potentiated state? Right? Well, that was really hard, and we kind of left it alone for a while. And then we got a clue, and that was that this stabilization step involves a class of adhesion proteins called integrins. Integrins anchor the cytoskeleton internally to the matrix externally and hook things like this and make junctions stable. They do this throughout the body. They do this everywhere. Migrating, fibroblast, whatever you want. It, this is a job integrins do. They drive the cytoskeleton. They make stable junctions. So we said, well, wow, that's great. Integrins are involved. So now using that as a clue and the development of a whole battery of technologies that came along, including some that we developed, we gradually evolved a picture that looks like this. If you were in the LTP field, I strongly suspect that your favorite protein's not up there, for which I apologize. But I should explain. My good friend Jerry Rudy, who's a very astute psychologist, when I show these kinds of pictures, that thing over there, he says, well, that looks like a bowl of spaghetti. And it's just about as interesting. And I, of course, go, hmm, thinking, this is what a psychologist might say, faced with you know, real biological complexity. <laughs> but I take his point. So the story is not complicated. What happens is the theta burst comes along, the calcium comes in, the calcium goes over. Act well, there's also kinases being activated non-ionically, it turns out. Incredible. Bunch of kinases, they go over and they cause the integrins to shift from an inactive state to an active state. The integrins then launch, just as they do throughout every cell in the body, they launch a set of small GTPAs initiated cascades, cascades, parallel going into action. One of these cascades causes actin filaments to assemble, which we've observed in spines. Those filaments are now growing, they're very unstable. They're doing a thing that cell biologists like to call treadmilling. It seems, it's a typical example of what seems biologically, the stupidity of biology. It, it, what's happening is there's an actin filament and there's a piece falling off this end and it's going around and being added to the other end and it's treadmilling, right? Why? Well, in this case, it gives you a period when which you can erase the filaments you just built by simply using low frequency stimulation. You have the option for about seven to 10 minutes to go, I didn't mean to encode that. So you can erase it with low frequency stimulation. But after that, too bad. Because these other cascades kick in, and what they do is they cause those filaments to elaborate, to grow like this, and then to stabilize. And now you've anchored the synapse in its potentiated configuration. Okay. So what do we get out of that? That's the substrate. Where are the functional predictions? So here we go with something that came out of it that is predictive. Namely, the integrins in synapses don't behave, it turns out, like integrins everywhere else. They don't behave like good integrins. Integrins are sluggish animals. Once switched into one state, they stay there, but not in the synapse. So this is state of birth stimulation in panel A and it's causing an increase in the number or percentage of synapses that have high concentrations of activated beta-1 integrin. But then, 
10 minutes later, it's not on the slide, but 10 minutes later, the integrins shift back. Once they've triggered those cascades, once the skeleton's built, they go back into, they're gone, they're no longer activated. The funny thing is, we couldn't reactivate them. So you see those bars, those blue bars, are attempts to reactivate the integrins with another theta burst train. And you see at 10 minutes and 30 minutes, we could not reactivate them. But at an hour, they're back. The integrins had recovered. So this is strange new behavior for cell biologists. Well, that was fascinating to us because it led us to an experiment. We said, suppose you block the integrins before they become responsive. What happens? And what happens is the LTP goes away. We block them by putting in neutralizing antisera that are incredibly selective for this category of activated integrin. And the LTP in panel B just slides back to zero. Okay? But if you wait until after the integrins have re-entered their responsive state and do the same exact manipulation, 20 minutes later, you see it has no effect at all on the LTP in panel C. Okay? So this is a discovery of a second stage of LTP consolidation that we had no idea existed, and it was suggested by substrates. Okay? Is it there in behavior? Panel D is the object location test, the object location memory test, and I'm sure you all know how this works. And you have the animal up there, two objects, right? 24 hours later, come back, he sees one of the objects in a new location. Now, we did exactly the same thing for the, for the learning that we did for the LTP. We go, I look, I can go both, both sides. Yasa, you're a genius, you really are, this is great, and go over here now. This is this side of the audience. And with this thing, I could actually get down here and come out there. I'm scared. Oh, no. Yeah, that's how I got this kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, so over here, you see we've, we infused the neutralizing antisera into the dorsal hippocampus at various times after the animals have learned. If we get it in there before the in integrins become active again, we completely block memory 24 hours later. But if you just wait 20 minutes later, you wait until the time period that you're past that one hour period when the integrins reactivate, bingo, you have no effect on memory at all. So this is not only a second stage of LTP consolidation, it's a second stage of memory consolidation. A memory consolidation stage that's now built on basic biology and has a very, very narrow, sharp time frame. Okay? And we went further. And now we get deeper and deeper into real memory. Again, all from looking at cell biology. Now in this case, we didn't put anisir in, we put in a second train of theta burst. So we put a second train of theta burst in immediately prior to the time the integrants become responsive. And absolutely nothing happens. It's the same LTP. It doesn't change the LTP at all. I just realized I've lost a pointer mic. Don't worry about it. Um, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, my search algorithms are crap. They really are, it's pathetic. And my cognitive flexibility is going to hell in a handbasket because I can't make it work. Ah, well, that's all right. You can see in panel A, right? Second theta burst stimulation, 40 minutes after the first one, did nothing. It does work, hey? Duh. Uh, well, where is, oh, there it is. There's my problem. See there? Nothing. Now you just wait 20 more minutes before you deliver that second theta burst train. And I've never seen anything in a wasted life in LTP that struck me as dramatically as that. We doubled the LTP. Just waiting 20, more, 20 minutes further, waiting till after the integrins have become reactivated, and bingo, you can double the LTP. And here you see over here, we're doing it three times, and you wind up but it has to, you have to wait this one hour. That's why we never saw in all those years, this is recent stuff, we never saw any of this in all those years of working out LTP. We never saw anything like this, this magnitude of LTP, threefold greater synaptic strength because we never thought to wait an hour. 
And is that predictive of a space trial effect in behavior in a hippocampally dependent behavior? And we use this object location memory test again because that's, Marcelo Wood told me that's a dependent on field CA1. And Marcelo is the chair of our neurobiology behavior department. <laughs> so that's plenty good enough for me. I don't know. Does he rank you or? Never mind. Uh, listen, folks, you got to know who to believe in this business, OK? Now, you can see what happened here. We've taken the object location paradigm. We give the animals, they need five minutes of sampling to and get a long-term memory. We give them three minutes. We give them three minutes as a mass trial. They got no memory 24 hours later. We take the three minutes and we divide it into three one-minute segments. We separate those three one-minute segments by 40 minutes or 20 minutes. They don't learn anything. Separate them by an hour, and you can see the effect right there. See how big that memory is? This is a study done by Ron Cease. Now, it's even more dramatic. You can reduce that one minute to 20 seconds, three 20-second sessions. As long as they're an hour apart, the animals show very robust memory. So what's going on here? This is incredible. So we have space trials that are producing, this might be the biggest space trial effect described. Because essentially, at the end of the day, we're saying that we have increased the potency of learning by a factor of five. OK? Now, what is happening here? How can we get all this extra LTP that nobody knew was ever there? And we went in, and we used a technique we developed that allows us to look at actin polymerization in individual spines. And what we found out was that that TBS number two, when delivered an hour with an hour's delay, doubles the number of spines that are exhibiting high levels of filamentous actin. It means that after an hour, there was a large population of synapses that did not respond to TBS one, but now respond. And what we've discovered here is that CA1 contains a huge population. The majority of the synapses have a high threshold for synaptic modification. All right? They're kind of like laying there latently. They're latent, waiting for you to use the appropriate learning paradigm to maximize your encoding. Right? And there's all kinds of good arguments for why you want space training. Something's telling me I better start to speed up. What time do we, five o'clock? Ooh, 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 this is bad. Uh, let me race, let me race, race. Okay, <laughs> let's race very long. Okay, so now having come through all that, we said, let's, this is great. Uh, let's boldly go now where we've never gone before and show this kind of generality that this effect is a general explanation for LTP. So we went back to where LTP started in the performant path and we specifically the lateral performant path. And lo and behold, the LTP was presynaptic. Oh, I, this is my summary slide. I'm always like, here, the LTP is presynaptic. There's two tests that physiologists use. Well, we started for the uh, study of pre and postsynaptic LTP in CA1. Two forms of test. One's called the pair pulse facilitation test. In that test, if you increased release by your manipulation, in this case LTP, then you reduce pair pulse. That did not happen in CA1. That happened in the lateral performant path. The other test is if you've increased release, you increase currents through both NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors, right? Because they're both co-localized. The glutamate's coming out. More glutamate, more currents, right? That's exactly what happens in lateral performant path. That did not happen in CA1, where the AMPA current goes up and the NMDA current does not. That was one of my big arguments for LTP being prosynaptic, but here it says it's presynaptic. Now the problem is that you can block this LTP completely, and we did this, by buffering postsynaptic calcium or by blocking NMDA receptors. So it's induced postsynaptically, just like in CA1. But this is saying it's expressed presynaptically, so you need a retrograde transport, you need a retrograde marker. And that proved to be 
the endocannabinoid 2-AG, okay? So it's a strange kind of LTP right off the bat. I'm gonna quickly go through the mechanisms we gradually worked out for this. So this is the picture of what happens. This is the conventional endocannabinoid signaling story. All right, and this actually operates in field CA1. You have the glutamate is released, binds to the metabotropic glutamate receptor 5, that triggers the synthesis of 2-AG, which diffuses to the presynaptic side, where it phosphorylates a protein called MUNK18-1, that causes this vesicular protein to become inactivated, and transmitter release goes down. Okay? In other words, endocannabinoid signaling reduces transmission. And we actually found that this system is actually operative in field CA1. But Laura will like this. You've waited patiently for something that's, it only operates to gamma frequency stimulation. Whenever you have gamma frequency going through the hippocampus, the frequency facilitation it's producing is blunted by this endocannabinoid mechanism. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything, and it certainly doesn't contribute anything to LTP. That's the story in CA1. Here's the story in the dentate gyrus, or at least in the lateral performance path, is completely different. That pathway I just told you about has actually become very subsidiary. It's now a secondary pathway. It's weak. Instead, the endocannabinoid signaling is going someplace nobody would have ever guessed. The CB1 receptor, the receptor for the endocannabinoid, which incidentally we established with super resolution microscopy, is located presynaptically on those terminals, for those of you who want to dispute. Uh, it's going to a protein, an enzyme called focal adhesion kinase, which is the number one, one of the two effectors of integrants. You see? It goes over and boosts that enzyme. Uh, but it doesn't get its partner, PYK2, which is an homologous similar protein, but it doesn't activate that. But that's all okay because the same glutamate that was being released, the same glutamate that's being released to stimulate the endocannabinoid system, well, is also stimulating NMDA receptors. They wind up creating ligands for the beta-1 integrins and now you get the full integrant signaling. We were able to establish that this presynaptic enzyme, ROC, is being driven, and that's going down and shifting this, this, the presynaptic cytoskeleton. And now you have a cytoskeletal change presynaptically, you got docking sites, and release goes up. That's what we think is going on with this LTP. In other words, it's atypical endocannabinoid signaling has created this. So quickly about the LTP and the lateral performance path. This is induced postsynaptically, expressed presynaptically. Thanks to Carl, Carol Barnes here, we know that it lasts for weeks. And uh, she had to convince me of that in her doctoral work as I was the, the cruel outside evaluator. You sure? But all the good stuff I was telling you before isn't there. All that cool CA1 stuff, none of it. No space trials, no second stage of consolidation. All we've done is translocate a lot of CA1 machinery to the presynaptic side, and we've lost all these magical properties. Also, I forgot to mention this earlier. LTP in this pathway is not sexually dimorphic. LTP in CA1 turns out to be sexually dimorphic. And I think from this point forward, we are going to have to begin discussing female LTP and male LTP. And I am starting a movement to show my creds to the university. I'm starting a hashtag free LTP movement. <laughs> free female LTP movement. Too long have we ignored female LTP. Anyway, uh, where was I? <laughs> So, uh, but it's true. What I just told you is true. Fem LTP and CA1 is strongly dimorphic. And in, 
Uh, better is hard to, to say. Uh, I mean, I think it's better in the, in the girls, personally. Uh, anyway, uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> But you'll, you'll be seeing it on television, hashtag free LTP. I mean, it'll be everywhere. Millions of people will be following it. Trump will make pronouncements on it. <laughs> the, the French will back me up. Now, the substrates predict different forms of modulation than found in CA1 or the medial performing path. And here we come to what I think is a key point about why this is this way. Why have all this different kinds of stuff? And I think the answer is, we predict, we haven't shown it. Remember this performant path stuff's lending into dentate gyrus where there's a big healthy contributions for the septal cholinergic fibers and all that, they modulate. I am going to predict here that state modulation of LTP by using different forms of LTP here, there, elsewhere, you'll be able to adjust which pathways, what types of information you're going to encode via working on these differential LTP mechanisms. And I can already sketch that out for the CA1 versus this thing, but I should move quickly to this. I'm sorry I won't have time to talk about how we successfully figured out what's wrong with fragile X in the brain, but that's okay. Let me just take 10 minutes. Sorry, if we get a few extra minutes, I may come back to it, but I need to get on to this. You will recall a long, long time ago, I said there were going to be two points, an A and a B, that were going to be related to the hippocampus helping the cortex do memory. We have at last come to B. And what we want to do is we want to build simulations of the essential circuits in hippocampus that are radically different than circuits found in the cortex. It's a question, how could these help memory encoding in the cortex? Now, along the way, I've done a lot of modeling work in, across the years, working with the assumption that a synapse is a synapse is a synapse. And before we went too deeply into this, we said we should check some of this after discovering that synaptic plasticity is different wherever you're looking. So we start off a very simple question. Just put in a simple theta train on these synapses and ask, is the frequency facilitation of the synapses the same across all these connections in the hippocampus? In other words, how is the synapse transforming the signal? And what you have here, this, this is a study that got out of control. We went all the way back to the lateral olfactory tract input to the piriform, then through the piriform, enterinal, into the uh, dentate gyrus, and then through the hippocampus. Measured every one of those synapses. It turned out, the frequency response to theta stimulation was different at every synapse. They were all different from each other. And in some cases, radically shown, uh, radically different. You can see that on that C panel. Not on that C panel are the mossy fibers. You remember the bizarre mossy fibers? They won't fit on this graph. They literally would go right off the top of the graph. I mean, if you ever want to see frequency facilitation in your life, try the mossy fibers. But even the remaining ones are very different. So we had this information, we shoved it into a simulation, and we asked what happened. It's actually quite remarkable. But in the simulation, by the time you reach here, called the LPP, by the time you reach the dentate gyrus, you have this, you have this facilitated firing, and then everything decays back to baseline in a 20 to 30 second period in the face of theta stimulation. But the output of CA1, the output of the hippocampus of CA1, it goes up, reaches a new state, and is stable. Magic. The input to the hippocampus is decaying across the train, but the output is stable. So what was the answer to this? How can this happen? What's in between? And what's in between is the mossy fibers and the associational system of the CA3, the massive associational system. It compensates for the decreasing input by boosting its output, and the whole thing came out. Believe me, this is not staged. It all came out, flat output, and then rapid, well, I should say catastrophic collapse of the entire output, which is, of course, the hippocampus way of saying, that's enough of this, move on to the next episode. All right, well, we had this data. 
and we're ready to play, we're ready now to move into the CA3 field to see if it can really behave like our simulation said it should. And what you see here are the first studies on this. These are done by Ben Gunn and Connor Cox. And what they're doing is stimulating two separate inputs of the, of the associational system, all right? Very weakly. If you look up there in the top right, you can see the EPSP. That scale on there is 100 microvolts. The EPSPs we're measuring here, field potentials, are less than 100 microvolts. They're tiny. But there's two of them coming together, separate populations. We turn them on, and you give the thing two seconds of theta. Now, if you look over here, you can see the baseline. These are spikes. Over here is the baseline, and right there, and you can see the spiking. Now the two seconds of theta stimulation to these two electrodes, and you can see the increase in activity. Now the astonishing thing here is that increase in activity set off by that two seconds of theta goes on for seconds and seconds and seconds, and it's still there a minute later. It's as though it really is a system that once you set it in motion, will go on firing on its own. Maybe some kind of buffer memory, right? In fact, uh, Dr. Gunn has got cases where he could see this increased firing minutes after the, the theta train. So we're, we're really racing this down. Okay. I won't have time to fill this in. We did other tests to see if it's a regenerative network, a recurrent network. All such networks work in narrow time, rather parameter spaces, and you know, small decrease, small increase, the thing collapses. These, slide, these studies over here are showing that this network is like that. Small disruptions either collapses or blows up. All right, and I concede, unfortunately, we're not going to have time to do septal modulation of all this, so I want to go just now to the conclusion. So with all this stuff we're gaining on the operation of CA3, we felt emboldened to go ahead and build a model and ask the question of whether it could solve or deal with episodic time. And this is work by Connor Cox. And what you see in the simulation is, at the top, there's a dentate gyrus, there's a CA1, but most of the simulation is focused on CA3. It has feedback interneurons, feed forward interneurons, and over here on the top right, this is the connectivity. Local groups of cells are densely interconnected. They connect to other neighborhoods with weaker connections, okay? We turn this thing on. You run this simulation. That's shown down here. And you can see that those, this is time at the bottom of the thing in milliseconds. Already we're running in hundreds of milliseconds. A hundred millisecond cue comes in and input through the performant path and the mossy fibers. And you can see the simulation spreads to a local population of cells and then it dies off, the activity dies off on its own. Now, in Local other neighborhoods, like in that top right picture, you see a distant, uh, e a, another neighborhood that you're connected to, you're actually, believe it or not, act in the simulation, it turns out excitation is increasing steadily. So while the first neighborhood's turned, turning itself off, other neighborhoods are receiving more and more excitation relative to the amount of inhibition they're receiving, okay? So that results in what you see here in the bottom right. The cells fire, and we've got the neighborhoods contiguous here. They're not in reality. The cells fire, and then suddenly another neighborhood takes off and starts firing. And then after three or 400 milliseconds, another neighborhood takes off, and the original neighborhood stops. In other words, in the strange behavior of the CA3 simulation, you initiate activity here, and it kind of walks its way across the whole model which in this case has only got 1,000 cells in it. Well, now we add LTP to this, and something strange begins to happen. Now, the LTP rules are automatic. Whenever there's enough NMDA current, the cell the synapse will potentiate. So the LTP is actually happening while he's doing that walk. While the activity is migrating, connections are being strengthened. And it, you see here in the middle, we put input number two in. Suddenly there's a new input. The overlap between the last group of cells 
that were activated by the initial input, the last group, so it might be like neighborhood four, it now connects up with the new input, connects up with neighborhood number one. What this means is the duration between the queues is represented by the system by how many neighborhoods you pass through before you get the second queue. The system, and believe me, this was a discovery by Dr. Cox. This wasn't even built in. The, net, the system is telling you that it does time by trading space for time. And now we're back to Yuri Bazaki. Yes, indeed, space and time. But space and time in the hippocampus now. We're trading space for time. You represent time with space. And now you hook up these two guys, and then that guy goes on, another queue comes along, and the system continues doing this. And you can string together a long sequence. Now, look at this interesting behavior when you put in, when you ask it to retrieve. And what's all that's happening now is we're just putting in the first queue. Okay? The first queue kicks off the blue migration. That's, that's retrieval. And that goes on to eventually it kicks off the cells that were part of, it was part of the second queue. You see, those are the blue ones there are now the representation of the former, what was learned as the second queue. And then finally, it pulls in the third queue. So what you have here is this system is recalling the sequence in the proper order. It's time compressed the whole thing. And most importantly, it's captured the time between the stimuli. This is a representation. This is a novel way of capturing how, what is the proper distance between the cues. And so you have that in your episodic memory. I can ask you that. I can say, oh, you saw this movie, and you saw this character, and then you saw another character, and then you saw another character. Which one do you think was the biggest interval between them when they arrived? In fact, it's fundamental to you having an episodic memory to know the intervals between the events. And this system captures it. So to finish up, I just got a card there from the boss. Ah, uh, that system can encode sequences with real time. Also, back to my original point, we are talking about hundreds of milliseconds, both in the physiological experiments and in the simulation. We are talking about intervals that are long enough to prompt the assembly of cinematic information in the cortex. You've got your hundreds of milliseconds here, and we're quite confident we build this thing, when we build it out to 10,000 cells, that it will be able to encode information such as that cue needs to be, the representation needs to be held for hundreds of milliseconds. And where we're going next, where we are, you can ask about this. <laughs> we are trying to do true episodic memory in rats, which is not easy. True episodic memory in rats. So we've built a very elaborate system in which these rats have dense experiential learning prior to ever being put into this thing. And then they wander around and they learn this very complex world and they do it through a series of episodes. And we've been able to map which of the plasticity systems are being engaged. And the answer here is, that here's these super sophisticated, really smart rats, and they are putting almost all their synaptic changes up in CA1, which takes me back to my point. For this indication, they're modifying that output of the network I'm just talking about, and that's, I have to thank my, uh, the people who did work. There they are. Thank you. I'd like to give you some praise, but Yas is cutting me off. Uh, <laughs>